It's Wednesday, which means it's time for a first look, our version of an unboxing video. But first, we must start with a complaint because it appears we have not been using enough neon tubes in our videos. People want more. They need to see more. Behold, will this do it for you? This is in fact not quite all, but nearly all of the neon tube lights that I own. There is a reason we use these neon tube lights because they are super small, battery powered, they are magnetic, which means we can put them anywhere and we can dial them to, as you can see, whatever color we want. And that makes them super practical, super fast, and super easy to use, and it means I can put lights anywhere and get lit fast. We all know the feeling of paying high fees and waiting for transactions to confirm when interacting with DeFi. I suffer from that every time I do a tutorial or a first look. Well, no more. Solana has built a fast, censorship-resistant blockchain where you can build and use crypto apps that scale today. The network supports thousands of transactions per second with fees less than a cent and over 500 validators. To learn more, head over to solana.com forward slash defined to get started building and join its rapidly expanding community. So that out of the way, let's get on to the main thing here, which is Uniswap version three. Now this was announced back on March the 23rd of this year. And one of the big, big, big features was concentrated liquidity. What does this mean? Well, it's the ability of market makers, and that's you and me and anyone who supplies liquidity to Uniswap, to allocate that liquidity to a specific bracketed price range. And why that's interesting is because normally when you supply liquidity, it goes from zero to infinity. So the ability for you to actually use the, the fee structures of the liquidity that you've applied to a uh, liquidity pool are quite limited, but by allowing users to bracket where they supply their liquidity, it should mean that larger players, the ones that actually supply the liquidity, can use sophisticated strategies to make more money off providing liquidity and then build out more things on top of that, which we still haven't seen yet, but it opens up different ways to be more refined about the way that we see liquidity enter pools. It also means that it'll probably be more gamified and more competitive, and that should be a good thing for users. Now, the other thing that we have here is multiple fee tiers. You can select how much you actually want to make from a specific liquidity pool. There's like three different tiers here, and it all depends on the level of risk you want to take on. So for stablecoin pools, there's not that much risk, so you probably take a smaller fee. But for larger, riskier, pools, let's say it's a new token that's launched, or you're farming something slightly risky, you don't quite know whether it's going to work out or not, you might set a higher tier. And they claim that LPs can provide liquidity with up to 4,000 times capital efficiency relative to Uniswap version 2. And there are a few other things that we can look at in Uniswap version 3, but it's primarily that, it's this concentrated liquidity provision that is so interesting. And we'll get on to range orders, which is another slightly complicated thing to get your head around, but we'll look into that in a bit. And one of the other interesting parts of this is that <clears throat> if you're used to providing liquidity, you get LP tokens. Now these are tokens that represent the ratio of the amount of assets that you put into the liquidity pool. But in version three, you don't get an LP token, you get an NFT, still, figuring out how exactly that works. But if we look at a protocol like Visor or like Alchemist, I think Method as well, they're using smart vault NFTs to allow users to interact with Uniswap, for instance. And then the advanced oracles using TWAP, uh, there's a new version of TWAP that's come out uh, with version three, that's pretty interesting. And there's some new news that came from Vitalik, or at least a piece of thinking that came from Vitalik this morning that we'll also look at that kind of feeds into that idea of oracleization. Now, if we look at the top DEXs by trading volume on CoinGecko today, Uniswap V2 is still number one, 2.191 billion in volume, still boggles the brain when I think about how much volume that is compared to something like Coinbase or Binance. It is huge, just shows you how far we've come. SushiSwap, very closely chased by PancakeSwap, and then down in fourth place, Uniswap version 4.543. So combined, Uniswap is pulling in two and a half billion dollars worth of volume in 24 hours, which is significant. 
What I find extraordinary though is on Uniswap version two, the most traded pair, SHIB. <clears throat> it's, uh, if you wanted to see what's going on with SHIB and why that one is pumping, I'm not gonna get into it here because, yeah, you know. So <clears throat> if you're looking at Uniswap version three, Ethereum, yes, USTC, yes. And then again, <laughs> SHIB is the third most traded pair on Uniswap version three. So those doggy coins doing the bizzo. So let's just get straight into it and jump into Uniswap to have a look at some of the ways it looks different and it acts different to what we might've been used to. First, straight away, you can see that the swap interface is different. There's, it's just smaller. Um, I'm actually gonna connect my wallet. This all works as you'd be accustomed to. Then you've got some uh, additional things here. You've got, uh, you can set a deadline for the transactions. Uh, I'm not sure if that was in the old version. I never actually used it to be honest, but uh, that's in there. And you can disable multi-hop, so you can tell it you don't wanna do a hop from let's say a token that needs to be swapped to USDC and then onto the token that you want because that's often how the routing happens. Um, and obviously every time you do those hops, you incur fees and yeah, you might wanna avoid that. Then if we go to the pool, that's where things start to get interesting. So you've got um, a little helpful tab here, which takes you into, I believe, this page on their uh, documents, documentation site. And that will run you through providing liquidity on V3 because it's not at all like what you'd be accustomed to. In the old days, um, on version two at least, you will be asked to supply a 50-50 ratio of one coin with another coin, two assets, so that they're matched, and then you add that to the pool, and that becomes your percentage of the pool, and you'll be issued tokens that represent your position in the pool. That's not how it works here. So let's have a look and see how it actually does work. So here we can, we've got a few different options, but what we want here is to click on the new position, and so now we have to select a pair. So, I'm gonna do the ETH die pair, just because it's one I'm quite familiar with. Um, so ETH die. And the very first thing you notice here is that we have a fee tier that we have to select. So we have a 0.05% fee, we have a 0.3% fee, and we have a 1% fee. And it says best for stable pairs, best for most pairs, best for exotic pairs. Now there's no way that ETH die is what you would call an exotic pair. So let's set it to 0.05%. Now, if we were to set this to 0.3% or 0.1%, you can see down here that this percentage here that allows us to set our range increases. So the lower the fee, the lower the range adjustments that you can make, and as we up it, it gets larger. So effectively what this is saying is that the die ETH pair is relatively stable compared to something like uh, a new coin that's come on the market or um, you know, we've seen tokens launch and, and have huge price volatility. Um, that's where you would look at that. So then the next thing we can do is we can set the bracket, we can set the range that we want our liquidity to sit within. So it will tell you down here the current price, ETH per die is uh, 0.0023192. I'm actually gonna change it to the die price because I find that a little easier to work with. And as we can see here, ETH has been on an absolute tear, charging past $4,000. So what I wanna do here is set a range. I wanna set uh, a range of, let's say I think, you know, it can run down to, I mean, it can probably go down to, let's say 3999. And then, you know, the max, I think in this particular point in time, let's say 4,500 feels like a mental point where it would bounce and, and come back down. So that, that is a $500 range, which I think DAI and ETH can happily trade within where I will I likely get some good, good action going on. So that gives me uh, a, a balanced pair. So I can basically add ETH to that pool and then add DAI to that pool in equal measure, and that will give me uh, a, rep, you know, a, a liquidity position in that pool. Uh, we can also change the range so it's much smaller if we want to, but it really depends on your read of the market. So this is, as you can probably tell already, this is for 
more sophisticated market making type people who are looking to apply probably quite a lot of capital towards liquidity provision and who will be using bots and analytical tools to decide where those ranges should be set and then adjusting them on the fly fairly rapidly and fairly often. Now there is another uh, interesting facility here which is you probably, when you come to liquidity provision, you think, well, why do I need to provide both sides of the pair? Uh, and that's because, well, in every exchange, there is a maker and a taker, so you provide both sides of that equation. Now, with Uniswap v3, that doesn't need to happen. And you have to bear with me here because I'm still kind of figuring out exactly how this all works. But what we're looking at here is range orders. And range orders effectively state that if the price of a token goes above the range um, that it's currently trading in, then you can apply one, one token on the side of that swap and it would effectively work like a limit order. It's a little bit complicated, but we can have a look and see how that might work just by doing it. Um, I say it's complicated, it's not that complicated. So what we would do here is we would set uh, the max price range to somewhere like... 4,000, let's set it up to 5,000. Let's do that. And then we set the min price range to 4,500. And that will change now to giving me only a single token that I need to supply. And what it says on the other side is the market price is outside your specified price range, a single asset deposit only. So. <clears throat> what happens here is what I'm basically saying is when the price goes into that range that I have specified here, which is between 4,500 and 5,000, I would like to be in a position to earn fees off that price range from my deposited ETH, but I would also like to be able to sell my ETH for DAI when it gets to that point, which is, which is kind of interesting, really. You can do it going the other way as well. Um, if we were to set it to die, for instance, we could do the same thing, uh, but it's easy to look at the uh, ETH price. But they do say in the documentation that if you, it won't automatically execute that order. So if you want to realize profit at that point, you do need to manually withdraw your position. But you can see where this is going, right? You can see that they're starting to give us in AMMs some of the early inclinations of the same tools that you get in traditional trading um, you know, uh, exchanges like limit orders and, and more sophisticated tools effectively. It's a little bit kind of like, how is this gonna work in, in theory? But you know, wherever there's a facility like this, somebody's already coding a bot to take advantage of it and do it automatically. That is my theory anyway. So what else can we look at in uh, Uniswap V3? We've looked at non-fungible liquidity, flexible fees. Yes, the advanced oracles. So, Uniswap version two introduced time-weighted um, average price. And that effectively said at a certain point in time, that's the price, and then at another point in time, that's the price, and then you take an average of those, and that is your price. Um, the problem is that that incurs quite a lot of um, work on Ethereum to, to generate the information required, and that's quite expensive. So what they've done now is they've, they've enabled the system to bundle together lots of different price from, I think it's within the past nine days, yeah, within the past nine days, uh, into a single on-chain call, which means it's cheaper to get those price oracles plugged in and enables them to do things like create um, simple moving averages and exponential moving averages. <clears throat> so they've made it cheaper and they've made it the, the tools for um, figuring out pricing, correct pricing, more sophisticated and more complicated, yes, but it should enable Uniswap to kind of step up a level in terms of its uh, appeal to more sophisticated traders. And if you know a little bit about the way AMMs work, you need arbitrages, you need sophisticated market makers plugged into the system when it's operating at scale because otherwise it, the whole thing collapses, it doesn't work. You need all these different component pieces working extremely hard and extremely efficiently to keep the system alive and well and functioning as it should. Now, the, the other thing I wanted to look at was um, this new post from Vitalik, which came, he posted it last night, 
and he said, Uni should become an Oracle token. So I, I am still trying to figure out exactly what he means here, but he's proposing an alternative to Chainlink uh, for the Uni token to become an Oracle token. And this has provoked a lot of debate in the market, but it just goes to show how important Uniswap has become in the Ethereum ecosystem now. I highly recommend you read it. I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to give a proper opinion on this yet, but I, I thought it was fascinating. Um, he kind of states that Uni and Chainlink are the kind of the most valuable tokens on Ethereum right now. And therefore, the cost of attacking them and taking over and, and acting against the best interests of the, of the coin uh, will be so prohibitive that naturally the right things, the right outcomes would occur. Uh, but there's so much more in that article. It's not that long, but it's, um, yeah, it's definitely something to, be, to take note of. Now, the other thing that I wanted to look at from the original Medium post was the licensing. So this raised a few eyebrows because, well, as you know, Uniswap, or if you didn't know, well, you do know now, Uniswap has been copied and forked over and over and over and over and over and over again, not only on Ethereum, but across gazillion chains. And... I think Hayden probably got a bit pissed off with it, primarily because of SushiSwap, we have to think. Um, so they are licensing uh, V3 Core under the business source license, uh, which means that you won't be able to fork large parts of the code. We can actually go and look at the code on Uniswap as GitHub and see here it is. I'm not a coder, I don't know what any of this means, but if you were a coder and wanted to have a look through, you would see that maybe, maybe, there are pieces that you could not access um, but primarily, I think that is them saying, you know what, we're fed up of people copying our software and copying our AMM just to do whatever they want and making tons of money off it. We're just going to do our thing. And you know what? Fair enough. So that was our quick look at Uniswap. There is one other piece of news that popped up yesterday, which kind of baffles the mind. If you want to go to Uniswap, you go to uniswap.org. All good. But if you type in uniswap.com, it takes you not to Uniswap, but to SushiSwap. And you'd have to say, that is cheeky. That is so, so cheeky. Uh, one of the highlights of DeFi Summer last year was the incredible launch of Sushi, the vampire protocol, the way it just sucked liquidity out of Uniswap. And this just feels like another chapter in that saga. And it's fascinating. So I suspect DeFi Summer Part 2 will feature more of the same Sushi Swap, Uniswap. Competition is good for business, though. Let's never forget that. So I'm curious to see where that one's going to go. Uh, if you have any comments, leave them for us in the box below. Uh, if you have suggestions for what we should cover in First Look, please do let us know. And if you like the neon lights and you want us to keep them, also let us know. Because, you know, who doesn't like neon? I will see you on the next one. Peace.